We have not had the chance of having very many in-person uh, uh, Center for Social Innovation uh, talks uh, in a very long time, so it's very exciting to actually be here all in person and delighted that Zahira Mann can join us. Zahira is the president and CEO of Slate Z, which is a, a place-based uh, initiative, a collective impact organization, which she'll, she'll help explain to, to those of you that don't know what a collective impact organization actually is. Um, and their mission is to revitalize um, South Los Angeles uh, by, um, connecting residents to economic opportunity. Uh, she leads a backbone organization that's really coordinating a, a large number of network partners in, in, uh, in South Los Angeles, in the South Los Angeles Promise Zone. Another sort of interesting, sort of the Promise Zone being, being another sort of category of, of, of uh, um, uh, an initiative that, that I think is worth talking about. I'm really trying to address systemic poverty, not just in Los Angeles, but the Pro Promise Zone has a network sort of really working across, across the US. Um, prior to Slate, Slate Z, um, Zahira was working both in philanthropy um, and has a background in law. Um, she was a senior program officer at the Ralph M. Parsons Foundation, where she oversaw a portfolio that dealt with um, vulnerable children and families, um, were, uh, led another collective um, impact organization called Foster Together Network, um, uh, has worked at a number of different other uh, philanthropies and foundations um, over her career. Um, um, and I won't go on too long. I will, I, I will um, um, have, her, have her join us up here and we will um, talk a little bit about, about Slate Z and what it's doing and, and, uh, and, and her experiences. So thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. I am so thrilled to be here and to see all of your faces and the work that you're doing. And so um, thank you for that introduction about Slate Z. I think that kind of covers it in terms of the work that we're doing. Really, this is where you are, see like right now, this is part of our area in terms of Slate Z. So USC, um, this part of the campus captures that. And so you are part of the Slate Z geographic area. Um, and USC is a really strong partner with Slate Z. And so, yeah, just looking forward to talking more about collective impact. Yeah, can you tell us? Tell, tell so so a, so a, a good number, not exclusively, but a good number of these are students in my social innovation class, sort of undergraduates, a lot of public policy majors, juniors, seniors, sort of a mix. Um, and we haven't gotten to collective impact yet in in the class, so that's in a, after spring break. So could you tell us a little about how you think about what collective impact is and sort of what makes it as a unique sort of way of tackling um, problems? Sure. You know, what I always like to describe with collective impact is that there are ways to think about models where it's an academic model that you then apply to a community or to a population. That's not what collective impact is. Collective impact is the distillation of work that was happening already within community and then placed within an academic setting and an academic understanding and framing of explaining what was happening within community. So the example is that there was a program um, on the East Coast called Strive Together. That is the model that we all use in terms of collective impact. And then Stanford kind of wrote an article about this effort and identified a number of different elements related to collective impact. One of the elements is a backbone agency. That's what we are at Slate Z, is we're the backbone for the collective impact approach. A common agenda, so the South Los Angeles Promise Zone is the common agenda for our collective impact. Um, we also looked at shared measurement, continuous communication, and then mutually reinforcing activities. And all of those pieces together are what makes a collective impact approach. So you've probably seen lots of them throughout your life that are at different stages or different iterations. And the one thing I always try to really kind of hone in on when I talk about collective impact is that it's not collaboration. It is not mere collaboration. It's not mere coordination. It is a very thoughtful, very specific way of working together that all of these different elements, especially the data piece and especially the communication piece, are critical. And it really is an overextension of what you would typically do because you have to have all of those elements happening at the same exact time. And they don't all, the, the most advanced collective impact approaches have the best levels of communication. Um, but if you can imagine, like even within your group of friends, that someone may have an experience 
you know, someone else wasn't there, and so then they hear about the experience. You might have like a conflict within your friends. You're not always thinking all of the same things at the same times, even if you might spend a lot of time together. If you could imagine that and then scale it out to 100 organizations that then have all of their employees, all of their constituents, all of those people working together, there is a lot of room for a conflict and a lot of room for disagreement. And so that's why you're kind of constantly keep these pieces up because otherwise they fall apart just because it's all relationship based in the same way any relationship can fall apart. It's the same way, except that in this relationship you've decided to work on something very specific together. And because of that, you have to constantly kind of come back, constantly communicate and ensure that everyone's on the same page. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that coordinating and communication is. So I wanna, I wanna talk more about that. But before we go there, um, could you tell, give us a sort of what the origin story of Slate Z and sort of you and, and your, connect, you know, your connection to it, sort of, sort of how, where, where it is and its collective impact sort of story? Sure, um, so Slate Z has an interesting um, history. So in 2014, a group of community members and organizations came together and they were focused on the rail lines. Um, so right now, Los Angeles, so much of our geography is uh, really understood and defined by our rail lines. And those rail lines, when they've gone into communities, have really changed the economic landscape of that community. When Metro proposed the Crenshaw line, which is the line that is being I've worked on right now that will connect with Expo, um, that line, the community knew that it was gonna result in additional economic activity, just as the other lines have done. And what they wanted to do was to harness that economic activity um, and to be able to really understand it and take, and be able to leverage parts of it. And so came together to figure out how to do that. And one of the tools for doing that was to apply to be a federally designated promise zone. The first time we applied, we didn't get it. Um, and this is where kind of understanding the reasons why something doesn't happen becomes really important. So we looked at why didn't we get it? And really the issue was is that the way in which the federal government was understanding promise zones, it didn't make our landscape and our geography um, make sense within that context. So we went to the administration and we had some things changed. So after that was changed, the next time we applied, we were able to get the designation. And so we, there are three kind of phases in terms of promise zone designations. We're in the third phase. There is another promise zone within um, our city. It, they were able to receive the designation in the first phase. And then there are two others in California. So California has the most promise zones of any state, there are four, and then we have two in our city. Um, and so that particular way of coming together as a collective impact approach really started with the Promise Zone designation because those designations are all, there are 22 Promise Zones throughout the country, they're all designed to be place-based in collective impact approaches, really kind of going back to the Harlem's Children's Zone, which might be one of the collective impact approaches that you'll um, end up studying. And they have read about the Harlem uh, ch Children's okay. Zone. It's, 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 they may not remember, but it definitely has been in, been in, been in the readings, yeah. Yeah, terrific. Um, and so, um, yeah, so the promise zone is sort of being super important, and, and it, but that doesn't necessarily bring funding per se, right? It brings just sort of, the, the, what is the advantage of that designation, um, sort of, I guess, both as a coordinating sort of uh, bringing people together, right? Sort of, in a, um, but also in terms of, of funding and sort of making it easier to sort of do the work. So what do you think of the advantages or, or disadvantages, to, you know? Um, there are advantages, um, and the one, the piece about, there are some collective impact approaches which are designed around funding, and so a funder may stand up a collective impact approach, and so there's funding embedded in that, and I've worked on those before. Um, this one, when the federal government created the Promise Zones, they created them with absolutely no funding. So there is no funding attached to this, with an exception. Um, it is a leverage level of funding, so for example, um, we have a HUD liaison who is part of a place-based effort who we work with and talk to and she provides us thoughts and advice um, in terms of the efforts related to the Promise Zone. And then we also have AmeriCorps Vistas. We have an allotment of um, five AmeriCorps Vistas who are able to support us. And so the financial budgetary cost related to that for AmeriCorps is something that is then kind of allocated to Promise Zones. Mm -hmm. And it's something that we could separately apply for uh, with AmeriCorps. But that's the support that's been provided by the federal government. 
I think that the other, the bigger part in terms of the promise zone designation is how the parties came together. Typically with a collective impact approach, you could just decide that you're going to partner with each other. We're going to work on something. We have the single issue that we're focused on. And as a group, we all have different tools and skill sets and experiences that we're going to all put together to focus on addressing a specific issue. Here, with the Promise Zone designation, because of the way it was formed, we have an MOU with our partners. And so we have 70 partners, over 70 partners, who have signed an MOU that have said, as part of this effort, we're going to contribute X. And with each of them, that's been incredibly helpful to understand for all of our partners, what is their level of contribution going to be for the work, which is very different, again, than another Promise Zone, where an organization doesn't necessarily say what they're going to contribute to the work. It's just about the will of continuing to do it. Um, that has its own, having an MOU has its own kind of like benefits and, um, and drawbacks, but that's one of the pieces that's been a little bit different in terms of being a promise zone that is a collective impact approach. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So I wanted to ask you a little bit about, about funding and sort of the stability of funding and sort of the role of that. So one of our doctoral students here at Price, um, Cynthia Barboza-Wilkes, has done a lot of interviews with promise zone networks and, so, and, and sort of I've been working with her and talking with her about it. And one of the things that she's noticed is that the, you know, the stability of funding isn't, it, there's two, two issues, I guess. One is, um, to the, the if funding isn't certain, sort of the ability of keeping people involved and sort of it, 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 it you, and, and so that'd be one. And then the other is sort of turnover of people, right? Is in, in all of these organizations, people are coming and going. And so are, are either of those things that you experience as challenges um, at Slate Z, sort of either the turnover of, of people within the, your partner organizations or the challenges of sort of sort of having enough stable funding to sort of keep people at the table? Yeah, those are both have been really big issues. And you know, COVID has been a really interesting test of the partnership um, because as everyone went into a virtual setting, you know, our partners, we were regularly meeting with them in person. And once we went into a virtual setting, our partners had to do a couple of different things. First, they had to do all of the work that they were gonna do already within their organization. So all of the shifting that they needed to do with their staffing, with their clients, with whoever they're interacting with, they had to do that. And then with us, they then needed to dedicate time from a staff person um, to come to our meetings and to collaborate and to think together. And because there is no specific funding flowing through the Promise Zone designation, the draw of then being able to say why we're prioritizing this time from a staff person then needs to be about something that is very intrinsically connected to that specific organization. And so I think that with every collective impact effort, regardless of how they're structured, that is the piece that always needs to be front and center. Like, what is the interest in the other organization in terms of participating? Everyone has an interest and figuring out what their interest is and making sure that that interest is really top of mind for the backbone um, organization so that you can keep people coming back. We can't, the way that work happens in terms of partnerships is that for, for me as a coordinator of partners, I need to be aware of what my partners need in order to set the proper table for them. Because if I'm not aware of their needs, then they're going to have tons of needs that are going to require them to make shifts and to make adjustments and do all sorts of other things. And if I'm not aware of that, then we end up with partners not being able to engage and who are no longer available because we don't have a full appreciation for some of the other things that they're facing. And with us, in terms of the funding, there's no funding flowing through us. And so it's always kind of like lack of funding. And it really has to do with will and like what is the shared interest. And for us, the shared interest is transformation of South Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. And knowing that when you come to our table, um, we have these various partners who represent government, represent elected offices, represent nonprofits, we have the connection to communities um, and to residents and businesses, and that's why people keep coming back, because there is something there that is useful for them in terms of how they do their regular work, and they're able to do something with us that is more innovative, more transformational, um, a pilot effort, but that's what we are. We are an innovation lab, and people are tapping into us for that reason. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, in that backbone organization, that, that role that you play 
is so critical and so complex, right? I mean, because you have all these partners, as you said, they all have different interests and sort of re, you know, things that bring them to the table. How do you, how do you navigate all of those different interests? And um, I mean, I just, it sounds a bit overwhelming, right? To sort of think about all of those partners and, and um, yeah. So I'm just sort of curious, like, it's, it's such a critical role for collective impact to have that backbone organization, but it seems also just incredibly hard to, to operationalize, to implement, to sort of do, do well. Yes, it, it, is, it is challenging. Um, and I would say that it's, it's a delicate dance, yeah. right? Like it's, it's, an, it's an art of really figuring out um, who needs what at what specific point in time and what is going to draw someone to the table at a particular point in time. And the way that I um, ultimately kind of view these things, because this is the, the third collective impact approach that I've really dug into. Um, is that people will always come to the table when there's something there that's going to draw them in. And so what we need to figure out is where is the gap in the work that if we are addressing those issues at our tables, then it's addressing this gap in the work that's not being addressed anywhere else. Um, and so by continuing, continuously thinking about that, that's what helps to draw people in. Um, but you know, there, there are lots of different organizations. And so sometimes, and there, we live in, in LA, which is, is, is a city of, it's very large in many ways, but in many ways it's very small. And we have lots of politics also in LA. And one of the things that I've really appreciated because, you know, part of my career I was a public interest attorney and I represented a lot of nonprofits and a lot of governmental agencies is that our politics are very specific and when you first come to LA especially, people kind of want to approach it like a New York, but it really is a series of small towns, which means that you need to kind of know the mayor of every single small town, and you need to know who has a relationship with someone else who can move them. And so it's a great big puzzle, and if you like puzzles, LA is a really fun place because it's a big <laughs> puzzle. Um, and so a lot of the work is also figuring out that. You know, sometimes there is one person who, or one organization who's able to move 10 others. And so that means like, we need to focus on that organization because they're gonna be able to move 10 of the other organizations rather than focusing on another organization that may, maybe they're interested right now, maybe they're not, um, but their level of political capital is more limited. Um, and so trying to be strategic about how we spend our time and um, the partnerships that we we lean on sometimes more than others. That's perfect, and we we did we we did have talked about social networks and and, and exactly that right that, that who you who, who's going to have the most influence is uh, is important to know like who they're connected to and and what their uh, interests are. So that's 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 uh, fascinating. Um, so on the sort of relationship building side, so you you mentioned you've been involved in multiple collective impact organizations. So how do you think about sort of that? I mean, because those relationships are so important. Um, uh, how do you build those relationships? How do you maintain those relationships? And is it different in the Promise Zone than it's been in, in, in other of the collective impact organizations that you've been in? But what have you learned about that kind of relationship building over the course of your, your, your work in this space? Yeah, you know, I, I think that, I think it's different during COVID, yeah. um, but not necessarily different in the Promise Zone. I think that you build relationships authentically. You know, you really have to build them in a way that is, slow, you need to um, know someone first before you ever ask for anything. So there is a lot of um, political and social capital that you're building every time you interact with someone. You know, we have a number of VISTAs, as I mentioned, who work with us, and we constantly get this question about networking. And you know, we want to like, learn how to network or have more trainings related to network, networking. And networking is just relationship building. It is just being in relationship with someone who understands you, understands your brand, understands what you bring to the table, and they then have that in mind when they're interacting with everyone else in the world. And so once they have a clear understanding of you, whenever they interact with someone else, you can come to mind when there is something that would appeal to you. So that's just the key to networking. And with relationship building, it's the same thing. It's really being clear about what Slate Z does, what the organization kind of brings to the table, um, ways in which we can be helpful and effective. Sometimes that is telling the story 
over and over and over again um, so that we can come to mind for people when they're thinking about these other issues, but it's doing it in a very slow way. And what I like to do a lot with relationship building is I like to do a lot of like one-on-one -on -one conversations because the group conversations are really helpful um, for a general level setting. And then the one-on-one -on -one conversations, those are really great because that's when you get to know um, whether where the person likes to vacation. You get to know the name of their dog. You get to know whether they have any kids. Um, and you get to know all of this information about them, which isn't information that you know, you're going to use in any way. It's not helpful in terms of you know, this is something that you write down and that you bring up in another discussion. It really is something where you're building a friendship and a level of understanding with them. And it helps in a lot of different ways. And one way that it always helps in terms of this level of relationship building is that when things go wrong, it is so much easier to solve with people that you like. <laughs> and that is universally the case. You know, I was listening to um, the NPR one day, and they were talking about malpractice with doctors. And the doctors who have the most malpractice claims against them are the doctors that people do not like, who do not have a good bedside manner. So it doesn't have to do with skill set. It has to do with how kind you are to someone else. And so that's what the relationship building does, is that there's so much more that is eased because you like each other. And that process in a collective impact um, effort is really golden because you are not only just working with your partners, your partners are opening doors with other people for you. And so you have to constantly be thinking about the relationship building piece. That doesn't mean that you know, sometimes people, you have to make decisions that one person isn't going to like because it's not necessarily aligned with um, exactly what they'd like to see or, or they want to see something that's slightly shifted. So that doesn't always happen where you'll be doing something that exactly is 100% of what people like all the time. But they still trust you and believe in you and believe in the effort. So the relationship building is really key. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can you can think of any examples of any sort of conflicts that sort of have em, uh, emerged at any particular point that you could sort of talk through sort of how you, how you manage that and how you sort of bring people sort of back to the same, that, that same shared agenda? Yes, yeah, so many. <laughs> I'll use one that's not from Slate Z. Um, so for one of the efforts I was working on, uh, we, we knew that one of the things that we needed to do was to create a shared space um, where we could be celebratory and talk about the fact that um, we were working in community together. So for this particular collective impact approach, um, there was a lot of division within the, within the space. So the governmental agencies and the elected offices were separate from the nonprofits, were separate from the community members. And we really needed to, in order to move some of the work forward, we were working on data efforts and you know, other pieces that were more programmatic. But what we needed was a shared space so that, again, that relationship building so people could start to like each other and start to trust each other and then come up with new ideas for how to move forward. So we came up with this idea to have a conference. <laughs> and I got so much pushback of like, no, that's too much work. We're not going to, we can't do that. It doesn't make sense for this, this, and this reason. And in those discussions, it was like, well, what are we trying to achieve? Well, we're trying to get people to all come together. Well, how are we going to do that? We have to get them all in the same space. Well, this is a way to get them all in the same space. If you have another idea, just let me know. And <laughs> we can kind of like explore that idea. But this was the idea in terms of getting everyone in the, the same space. Then COVID happened. And the conference that we were planning for 500 people with a reception for more VIP people across the street, um, a full day discussion, we couldn't have it because everything was closed. And luckily, like we were um, just about to send out the invitations. And one of the funders was like, don't send out the invitations. The world is closing. Like, does it make sense? This isn't going to happen. So once we kind of got back the initial, past the initial changes that were happening, um, we decided to move to a virtual space. And again, I kind of got foot pushback of like, well, I don't know if people were going to want to do that in terms of a virtual space. How are we going to organize it? And I said, we've already organized this. We've already kind of figured everything out. We have the speakers. 
All we have to do is creatively redesign how we are going to roll it out. And eventually, like everyone kind of decided, like, yes, it's a great idea. Um, and we ended up having the conference. And what was key in order to roll it out was the roles that people were playing as part of the discussion. So that doesn't mean that we have a conference and I open and close the conference and I'm the only speaker in the conference. The conference was opened by someone who strategically needed to open the conference because of the place that they set. And it was strategically closed by a specific person who was an elected official because that person needed to be the person who was the closing part within it. Every single speaker was selected because they represented a group that needed to be represented in that space. And in our last day, the conversation was centered on youth because ultimately all of the work that we were focused on was centered on youth and they typically did not have a voice within the space. And they were the most important constituency of all. And so the very day that the elected official closed the conference, that person was able to hear the voices of youth before they closed the conference and even reference them like in the closing speech. So that was still able to happen. We still had that space that then allowed for a greater opening up and greater collaborative efforts. But people don't always want to do the pieces because whenever anything is, is different or out of the ordinary, it feels scary. And it's a matter of saying like, yes, part of this feels scary and I'm a very process person. And so it's just like, well, what are the steps to get to the scary spot? And once we lay out every single step, those steps are really small. They start to feel really manageable. When the first step is, let's just figure out who the speaker is going to be, then you can do that step. If you try to have the step be, and for that conference, for virtual conference, we still ended up having 500 people, unduplicated people who attended over the course of five weeks. And we did um, you know, an hour and a half each morning um, over those five weeks. So, we were still able to kind of achieve the results that we wanted to achieve, but we broke it up in a way that was manageable. And I think that that's ultimately what helps with conflict with collective impact is that you have to kind of acknowledge the fact that it's different for people and then walk them through. Here are the different steps. We can change any of these steps, but here are some proposed steps to get us to this goal. But our focus is the outcome and that is where we're going. And the more clear you are with people in terms of we have an outcome, we have a destination that we're going to, they feel a little bit relieved because there's someone who's saying with clarity, like, this is where we're going. How we get there, we can all discuss. Mm -hmm. But we've all decided that there's some place that we want to go, and I'm going to make sure that we get there. Mm -hmm. That's great, right. And, and I think even in that example of the, of, of the design of the conference, you know, whose interests are to be able to be, able to be visible at certain points, right? So all that, that, that knowledge that you mentioned earlier that you developed about these, all of the different players and the people, you could use that knowledge in creating the, com in the conference in a way that, that met what they needed uh, and invited isn't going to get them to, to show up. So that's a, a great example of sort of something you talked about earlier as well. So I, I, I love that. Um, so, okay, so, so the collective impact aspects, we, so there's the shared agenda. We've talked about that a little bit. The continuous communication, which I think one, talk about communication a lot. I don't know that we would ever have enough. Uh, that, that seems at the backbone organization. Um, we haven't talked a lot about measurement, sort of shared measurement, and, and, and that always seems like something that is complicated to agree on, on what metrics do we care about and what should we measure and how do we measure it. How does that work sort of within the Slate Z context? Um, so shared measurement is, can be really complicated because it's, it's really technical. Um, in terms of how you get to the right measurements. And we're really fortunate because we have great partners in USC um, and they're working on this for us. Um, so luckily, like with trying to figure out the, the data, like that's something where our partners initially, when we came up with the, when we were able to get uh, the Promise Zone designation, came up with a list of different things to measure. And they were these data scorecards. And they're aspirational in terms of what we can measure. What we were then able to do um, in our work with the Price School um, is that they can take what is aspirational and to make it practical. Like, what can we practically measure that helps us understand these outcomes? And so having the right partners who are able to do a little bit of like level setting and say, 
okay, this is the outcome that you're trying to achieve. And again, you know, this piece of process and really understanding how do you actually achieve that, uh, coming up with data metrics that are more, more practical, of things that we can measure it because there's a source, you know, rather than we would like to measure it, but there's no source to actually practically measure it. Mm -hmm. All right, so I'm going to open it up for questions, but I want to ask one more follow-up about that, um, sure. the measurement piece. So what, what kinds of things do you, do you are, the, are the metrics that you are attending to? Can you give some examples of, 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 of the kind of data that you do, do track? And mm -hmm. um, So one, you know, for, for Slate Z, we are, our entire effort is focused on economic opportunity in South Los Angeles, so economic revitalization in South LA. And we do that through five levers of change, like, focused on transit, education, jobs, small business and entrepreneurship, and public safety. So under the jobs work group and under the jobs efforts, one of the things that we measure are placements. Mm -hmm. how, many place, how many places have we seen um, throughout the Promise Zone designation? And so that information becomes really critical. Um, our goal is to have 10,000 residents move into living wage jobs throughout the, the period of the 10 years of the designation. Right now, um, as of our last uh, information that we were able to get, which is quite old at this point, um, there were 5,300 workers who were able to move into living wage jobs. So keeping an eye on numbers like that become really important, um, but that's one measure of what I would say, and I, I don't know how many we had, I would say at least you know, 50 or 60. Um, and that just being one of them. And so that's also part of the process is kind of taking that and shifting them to an actual number that is more manageable of what can we measure that tells the story that doesn't need to have 20 different measures for one specific issue, but we can start to look at more like five because that's gonna tell the story of the outcome and the impact. And so presumably you have to get all of the organ partner organizations have to be tracking the same metrics so that then that all gets aggregated together to get to your 5,300, right? And, and so, um, so it's, it sounded like sort of having USC or sort of having a partner that could sort of say, these are reasonable metrics, sort of gives it some legitimacy about coming to some agreement about what metrics we might, was, was there a controversy in coming up with the metrics themselves? Or does, does the, the expertise of USC enough to sort of say, okay, we agree, that's, that's a good measure that we, sh we, should, we should go with? We'll see, because we're going to be asking the partners this year okay. Okay. <laughs> um, as we revise all of this and see what their thoughts are. Um, I think we have a lot of really good reasons for the shift, um, so I feel fairly confident that we'll be able to get there. But it's the piece with all of this work is when people, when you're comfortable with something, even if that something isn't getting you the result that you're seeking, you still have to shift people from that level of comfort that they have to this other space that is actually going to be the change that they are seeking. Yeah, thank you for coming in today. I just have a question about uh, partnerships. So with a uh, partnering organization, how do you sustain those relationships uh, over time? I mean, uh, with you know, shifting uh, positions in leadership or shifting motives, how do you sustain all of that? Um, thank you for the question. Um, so it's, it becomes unique with like every single organization, how it's sustained. For, for us, because we're a federally designated promise zone and because we have this MOU, especially for those larger institutions that we're part of, that, that who are partners with us, who have signed that MOU, we can go back to the MOU. So if there's a large institution where there's been a lot of shifted leadership, um, there is this element of just layers of, let's just simply call it bureaucracy, um, that people have to go through in order to get approval. It is much easier than to say to the new person who's come in, oh, you signed this MOU, and this is what you said you would do. And for larger institutions, they're really comfortable just looking at that and saying like, oh, that's what we said we were gonna do? Like, okay, we'll do that. Um, for smaller organizations, the, the MOUs don't really have the same impact. And so in order to then get people back on board, um, especially if there's been any shift in leadership, they have to come at it from the perspective of what is the element that is going to help me in my work. Um, and I, I think 
you know, that particular piece is, is always a fair question and so always happy to answer it for organizations. And so what I end up doing is, and this is one of the things I did when I first came into the organization, is we have a steering committee. Um, the steering committee is a subset of all of those organizational partners. And so I met with all of the steering committee members and I said, you know, hi, I'm here, excited to work on these efforts. What are some of the pieces that you think we could be changing or thinking about differently? Um, and kind of gave them a platform to be able to have that discussion. And then through the continuous communication, able to also still have discussions with people about what are some of the things that they think are important. But it has to always connect back to whatever that organization is interested and focused on. And so with some partners, um, if it's, if there have been shifts in their priorities, sometimes that's me who kind of goes back to them and asks them, like, you know, are, can we find a way for, for us to continue working together? And sometimes it's another partner um, that then I ask to go and have a conversation with them. Uh, because there is the social and political capital that I've built with them, but then there's also the social and political capital that someone else has built with them. And that's also part of the partnership too, is knowing when you need someone else um, to say something that you think is important, but it actually needs to come from someone else to be received in a specific way. Yeah, uh, you mentioned the youth outreach, I, I think is a really like important point, but I'm wondering like what that co-production looks like and also if there's any pushback with like um, either if it's in schools or in like other local efforts with that because youth is a big part, but like you said, it goes unnoticed. So I'm wondering like just how you kind of keep that manageable. Um, it's, thank you for the question. You know, it's always a delicate balance because it, it really depends on the age of the youth. Um, and what you can do. And you know, I've worked on um, pieces where we were focused on system-involved youth, and there's a lot of delicacy in terms of how you engage system-involved youth. And so we were looking at really youth who had already kind of aged out of the system and working with them. And there are a few things that I've always kind of focused on as being priority efforts with youth. One is that they are experts in whatever we're asking them about. And so as experts, we need to treat them as experts and elevate their voice and make sure that their voice can really truly be heard. The second one is that we have to pay them. I don't believe in youth coming to spaces and working for free. Um, and so we provide them stipends and do other things in order to, as experts, hear their voice. Um, and then the third thing, really thinking, and this is something that when I was working um, at the foundation and doing Foster Together Network is I was also looking at their experts, we're paying them. The last piece with, with a lot of youth is that they're at an earlier stage of whatever sort of trajectory they're on. And so what are some of the things that we can do to help them along the way? So coming in and being part of um, a planning effort with us or a conversation with us is one step. But is there something else that is out there? Can we provide mentorship? Is there another program we can connect them to? Um, but thinking about all of those different efforts with respect to youth. And that's when we're, we're talking about youth as you know, expert advisors. I would say other pieces when we're talking about youth development and efforts to really help to inform and engage youth, a lot of times the partners that we're working with have their own specific youth development programs. Um, and so for us, the effort is how do we further highlight and augment that? And what are, what are the gaps? What do you need that you don't currently have that we can then talk about um, what are some of the systems and other efforts we can start to pull in that are going to help to augment the work that you're doing? We're really fortunate because LA County has done um, some significant work as it comes to youth and youth voice. So we have a youth commission. The council is creating a youth council. Um, so there is a desire to have youth at the table, ensuring that those pieces are effective and that we still get that, um, that voice in an authentic way becomes like the balance for every organization to really think about. I was wondering more on like the collaboration side with nonprofits. Like when you have your nonprofit partners, there's like, uh, at least from like what I've seen, there's a lot of nonprofits that have sort of the specific operational, like they have the goal of like, let's say it's building housing and they have like different methods of doing that. How do you, I know you mentioned like the different groups and focuses that you have, 
how do you really like make sure that when they're discussing like advancing your common goal like if they have conflicting approaches to things or like differing approaches they obviously believe in those approaches a lot but how do you kind of reconcile that and make it effective so that they can actually like work towards the final goals yeah no that's an um interesting uh, question and you know the example that I'll give is not a slate the example it'll be example um, of when I was at United Way and I worked on homelessness um, when we worked on those efforts a big part of the work was with a business leaders task force so yes we worked with homeless service providers yes we worked with organizations that were in Skid Row but we also worked with the chamber and we also worked with these business leader task force members who were heads of corporations or they were part of law firms. And so outside of their work with us, they may be doing things that are different than our core values and what we are doing together as a whole. And I think that what your question kind of gets at is that whatever you're doing in terms of a collective impact approach, there is the complexity of the partnership, but then there's also the simplicity of whatever solution or messaging that you're doing collectively. Because once you have a simple message or a simple effort, so with ours, economic revitalization of South LA, that's what we're all looking at. And with that, people are able to coalesce around that. We may not always be thinking the same way on lots of different efforts, but we're gonna coalesce around that. And it was the same thing in terms of the home for good efforts. Some of those business leaders had different opinions at different points of time. But what they knew was that homelessness was bad for business and homelessness in terms of a moral imperative of addressing it. There was also the reason of that people shouldn't be living on the streets. We should want them to be able to move into housing. And all, so when they kind of go and speak to like their business colleagues, some of their business colleagues may not really be interested in the moral imperative. They may just be interested in the fact that it's bad for business. But their messaging was still our core messaging. We're gonna end chronic and veteran homelessness. And your specific interest in terms of why that's important to you, that is important from like a general overall view, but together we're doing this thing that's gonna result in these specific outcomes. And the more you can be focused on the outcomes rather than the reasons in terms of why people are trying to reach the outcomes, the why starts to get us into levels of complication where we then need people to believe the same things that we believe. And that's a lot harder than just trying to get people to do the same things that we wanna do and to achieve the same outcomes that we're trying to reach sort of connects back to where you started about, you know, we're gonna, we all agree on this is the outcome that we want. And then we can talk about the different processes and, but, the, but that shared agreement on the outcome. Um, that, uh, and not the, I like that, not the why necessarily, or that, but just this is where we're gonna get to. Uh, thank you very much, Sahira, for, for sharing.